What's up, everybody? Before we get started on the podcast today, Josh and I have a couple of very special announcements to tell all of you about. And yeah, we're holding them in our hands right now. It's our next piece of merchandise. When you're seeing this, the Kickstarter should have just launched. And what we've got is a series of tokens. Wow. Yes, they feature many of your favorite guests from Game Nights. You can see here uh, me as a soldier token. Me as a goblin token. Of course. And we have the professor. We got Maria and uh, Megan. We have Cassius Marsh. We've got Melissa DeToro. We've got all of your favorite knights from the episodes uh, featured as these amazing pieces of art by Josiah Cameron. And like a lot of our previous merchandise sales, this is a limited time sale only, which means that if you miss the Kickstarter for this, you're never gonna be able to buy them again. Yeah, we're doing that thing that we always do, which is we're printing them this one time to order for this one Kickstarter. You're gonna get four copies of each one of the 10 tokens. So that's 40 cards total. We have them available in foil and non-foil. I do wanna say the foiling process we found, it looks super, super good. It looks amazing. We tested out many, many companies to get the right card stock, to get the right printing process. You know how obsessed we are with quality here at the Command Zone and for printing our merchandise, it's no different. But again, the Kickstarter, you wanna go over and lock in that order right now because this is the only time you're gonna be able to get it. We can't stress that enough. Yep, and that time will pass quickly. It's only 30 days, so the link's gonna be pretty much posted everywhere you can find it. And... We got um, another exciting announcement. Now, depending on when you're watching this show, the new Game Nights is either out or it's about to come out. Mm -hmm. We're not sure which. <laughs> um, but something that's going on with Game Nights, and we announced it there, and we're gonna announce it here as well, we're giving everybody another chance, just like last year, to come be a guest on Game Nights. Yeah, the process is gonna be fully detailed and is eligible for patrons only of the show. So if you've seen the episode of Game Nights, we talk about more there. Otherwise, you can head on over to patreon.com slash command zone, and that's where we will be posting everything you need to know about how to potentially be on Game Nights. Yeah, we get asked about it all the time. This is your chance. Don't miss out. Patreon.com slash command zone. Okay, let's get into the podcast. All right. Greetings, humans. You have entered the Command Zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. One, two, three, four. Don't look at me that way. <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> Wait, we switched keys. My bad, my bad, my bad. <laughs> All right, that's good enough. All right. <laughs> We didn't even we didn't even say we didn't even say the name of the song. That was my bad. Song. I switched the key. But it's okay. I was fishing for it. Really, it was bad. an honest yeah. mistake, Josh. That was an honest mistake. Uh. Speaking of which, that has something to do with the show that we're doing today. <laughs> hey, everybody, how are you doing? I'm your host, Jimmy Wong. You're listening slash watching the Command Zone podcast. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. We're just going with that. Yeah, I mean, you want that's gonna make it really hard for the Spotify person to even like figure out what that song was. I know it's not an honest mistake by the bravery. <laughs> That was like one of those radio contests back in the day, how they were like, we'll, pay, we'll play half a second of a song, and if you oh, can yeah. name it, you win this thing. Right? Yeah. Da -ba -da -ba -da. What was it? What was it? Could be anything. Could be anything. <laughs> so this is your show topic today, Josh. What's it about? So today we are talking about something we don't talk about enough on the show. You know, we're always conversing, discussing, breaking down, going in depth in uh, to deck building. Right, like a lot the, of deck building. Yeah, the cards that are in your deck and the card choices, and we're always analyzing and reviewing cards, you know, which one should be in, which should be not in. And one of the things that doesn't get enough attention, and I say this every time we manage to, to wrangle a topic about it because it's hard to talk about, is the actual gameplay, the in-game decisions that you make. And just logic would di dictate that there are a ton of games where the choices you make during the game are what determine whether you win or lose, right? Almost, I'd say, the vast majority of games, outside of just straight mana screw, yeah. The choices are what make... That's the difference between a good player and a great player. Right. So today we are going to talk about the biggest gameplay mistakes that most players make and how to avoid them. We're going to break down um, some mistakes we've made, mm -hmm. some that we see often. And, you know, this episode may not have to do with specific cards. And yet, 
We will be mentioning some specific cards, and the cards in your deck still matter, and you're still going to want good ones. And if you put good ones in your deck, you're going to have to buy them. That's right. At cardkingdom.com slash command zone. <laughs> I was like, am I doing it or are you doing it? Make, no, I know we're kind of looking at those. I was going to go for the make no mistake. The place to go after listening to this episode or right now is cardkingdom.com slash command zone, our affiliate link, our sponsor. You're going to buy these cards. You're going to need them. It's a great place to get them in great quality, great fast shipping, everything you need. Cardkingdom.com slash command zone. That's all you have to do. Put the link in and you're supporting the show. Easy That's as right. that. You're going to buy magic cards anyway. Just do it that way. And you are making sure that all of our content continues to happen. Another sponsor that supports us, and by buying their products, you therefore also support us, Correct. is Ultra Pro. You know, they have the awesome Eclipse sleeves. They have the guild-themed sleeves for all 10 guilds now. They have deck boxes, play mats. They've got hardcore metal dice, those heavy metal those dice, dice that are man. sweet. Yeah, the gravity dice. Ultra Pro, whatever you need to uh, spice up your battlefield, they've got it. Definitely check them out. And the final way to support all of our content is directly, if you go to patreon.com slash command zone, and we call out one lucky patron every single episode. And this episode is dedicated to George Spurgeon. Pretty cool name. George, you rock. Thank you, sir. All right. Well, let's go into the main topic here. The biggest gameplay mistakes, some of the most common ones. You know... I make these a lot, by the way. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, like I was saying, we focus a lot on cards in the deck, choices. We... We spend a lot, probably more time thinking about our deck than we do thinking about our gameplay, mm -hmm. right? Because you're like, oh, I lost that game. I need to replace this card, so I have a card to answer that right. card. Or new new sets come out. What cards can I take out and put in from the new set to make my deck better? But how often do you sit around thinking, Did you I know, play that third turn right? Yeah, or should I have done this in a different order? Or did mm. I, should I have used this removal spell on that instead of this other thing? Like, how often do you actually sit around and analyze what you did during the game? It's very hard to. There's a lot to keep track of four players at a table or five or six, and so many things happen, and so many decision points are made by every single player. You know, one of the things I learned by listening to Limited Resources is that one of the great ways to improve your limited gameplay, you can go and replay games on Moda. Yeah, you just watch so them, right? Watch your games, go step by step, and then ask, shoot, did I? should I have done that there? And there are so many times in Games of Magic where you look at your hand, you have three, four, maybe five different ways of going about your turn. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of times you can make mistakes in those small areas. I mean, logic would dictate that you make a lot of gameplay errors because there are just so many choices, so many paths. Right. And like, how often really are you choosing the absolute best path? But if you never go back and think about it and analyze it, how are you ever going to improve that aspect of your gameplay? And playing the game is, you know, a big portion of what causes you to win or not. Potentially the biggest portion. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to break down a few points that we see that are big mistakes that players are making. So for the first point is improper sequencing. And this kind of goes into three different categories. The first one we're going to talk about is mana efficiency. So there's a general philosophy in Magic in all formats. And, you know, I used to think this wasn't as true in Commander, but it definitely is. Yeah, 100%. And it's that, in general, you should play the most expensive CMC possible card on each turn. Right. And there's a few things that we're assuming here. One, that your four CMC card is better. Let's say it's your fourth turn. You have four lands, four mana. You can play a card that costs three or costs four. Typically, in the history of Magic, the four CMC card is going to be more powerful than the three CMC card. Now, that could be different, and but this is assuming that, right, if we're just going by these sort of laws of quote-unquote magic, quote-unquote laws of magic, that the four CMC card in turn four is going to be better than the three CMC card and that you should always be using as much mana as possible during your turns or throughout the course of your turn before it gets back to you. Yeah, I like that as like a baseline heuristic for how magic works. More expensive stuff, generally better than the less better than the less expensive. And by expensive, I mean CMC, the mana yeah. cost of the spell. Of course, there are some mitigating factors and there are going to be outliers. But in general... You want to use the most mana on each turn possible. I like what you're set up here. So we're turn four. We have four lands. Mm -hmm. In our hand, there's only two cards maybe we could cast out of our hand. We got some fives and some sixes. Those are not possibilities. But I have a four-drop spell, and I have a three-drop spell. In general, the four-drop spell is going to be better for a lot of reasons. One, like you mentioned, it's going to usually be the most powerful option for you at that moment. Mm -hmm. Two... Imagine next turn you draw a two drop. Ah. 
Like, you don't have all the cards in your deck in your hand right now. You can draw one of many cards. Or even a one drop, right? You may even have a two drop in your hand right now. Right, that's a possibility too. That means next turn, I play my land. That three drop in my hand can be played with my two drop. Wait. That's five, right? Wow. But if I played my three drop, and then I draw a two drop, on my next turn, I have five lands. I don't have the option to play the four drop and the two drop. Right. So I actually took away a potential line of play, an option, by playing the less mana efficient card this turn. And when I'm playing limited and standard and things like that, I'm thinking about that often, which is like, you know, there's a lot of reasons why you're talking yourself into not playing the the bigger CMC spell in the moment. Like, mm -hmm. oh, that's my better spell. I know it's more powerful, but I also don't want it to get removed, so I want to protect it. But then you run into the situation where like, well, now my next turn, I've made a suboptimal turn because of my choice on the previous turn. Right. You get two cards over two turns instead of three cards over two turns. Right. And those small advantages, those incremental values, they that adds up a lot over the course of a game. Because I've, I've had games where it's turn seven or eight and I have that two drop or the three drop that's just been stuck in my hand because I could have played out a turn earlier or three turns earlier, but just chose not to for whatever reason. But right now, it would have been great. Right. So you could have been having that out there accruing some kind of advantage over two or three turns also. Like maybe it's a, you know, a Deathrite Shaman or something mm -hmm. that's just like, uh, that's, that's four to six damage to my opponents maybe over that time or something that could have happened. So... Very important, I think, in general, unless you have a really good reason, you want to be mana efficient and you want to play the highest CMC spell possible out of your hand. Now, if you have two four drops in that case, well, then you're making a choice based on the situation at the table. Yeah. And and sometimes, obviously, you're going to go against this and you're going to play the three drop for specific reasons. It's all there are. Well, and we're, there's going to be different edge case scenarios or just even commonly confronted scenarios throughout this entire podcast. So don't take any of this as gospel, but these are just very baseline ideas. And yeah. this does make sense. Play a more powerful spell instead of a less powerful one. Okay. So we're still talking about improper sequencing. That was like point A. This is point B, which is play sequencing. So there's a, a thing I think that comes up a lot in games. And well, let me just ask you this, Jimmy. It's turn three. You have three lands in play. Great. Good start. Not mana screwed. In your hand, you have a choice. You have two different three drops. Okay. One is a card draw type spell. Let's say like a Phyrexian Arena. Okay. One is a three mana mana rock. Let's say a Chromatic Lantern. Ooh. What do you play? I am probably... Dropping that Chromatic Lantern. Because I, it takes me from three to five. And a lot of factors will appear in this, right? Do you have a lot of five drops in your deck? Is your commander a five drop commander? Do you have a five drop in your hand? I would much rather have, especially in the early turns, when you still have a grip full of lands or cards right, in your Right, it's turn hand. three, remember. So yeah. most likely you've got five or six cards in your I hand. I think you almost always want to ramp. Unless you think you're in a situation where you need to desperately dig for a card with Phyrexian Arena or that one extra card next turn is going to make a huge difference for you. But I think in general, you're looking to have a stronger start. So I'd play the rock out. Yeah, I agree 100%. In this case, most of the time, I want the mana. Just think of the advantage that gives me next turn. Again, mm -hmm. same scenario. What if I draw a two drop? Now I'm dropping the oh. Phyrexian Arena and the two drop next turn. Or like you said, my commander is CMC is five or I have a five drop in my hand. It opens up more options than the card draw right. uh, spell does. However, let's say I change the scenario. Okay. You have three lands in play. You have the Chromatic Lantern, the Mana Rock. You have the Phyrexian Arena. But in your hand are no other lands. Ah, now, that's an interesting one, because I think hitting land drops, as we all know, is very important. Probably the one thing that I underrated the most when I first started playing Commander, just how important that is. I think in that case, you're going to want to prioritize playing a card draw spell. Yeah, I agree. Because you think of the difference between drawing a land next turn and not. It's yeah. the same as playing out your playing, your th playing your mana rock, right? And so I'd much rather... And for Arena is something that triggers on your upkeep. So right. you're not going to be able to draw out of this scenario necessarily if you, yeah. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you know what? I've seen streamers do this quite a lot too, where they'll look at their hands and go, I could go out and start ramping, or I could make sure I hit my fourth slash fifth land drop. And almost always they're going to go for hitting a land drop. And yeah. if they don't, they're saying, I'm being very greedy here and hoping I draw a land off the top of my deck. Yeah, I believe that hitting your land drop should be actually your most important thing, especially in the early turns. Like... 
the difference between your 10th and 11th land drop is not mm -hmm. huge, but the difference between your third and your fourth land drop is gigantic. Massive, right, right. Right. And you can snowball to the point where like if you miss your land drop next turn, and even if you draw it the next, you could be so far out of it. Yeah. Because everybody played a five, then a six, and you played another three drop. Yeah. We already know how bad it feels to go last in turn order. If you're missing land drops, it's like you set yourself back another turn rotation a lot of the times. So you had an example here, though, and we talked about this, and maybe this is what inspired this topic to begin with. Right. So uh, something we noticed, or I noticed, in the last episode of Game Nights, uh, this was the Ravnica Allegiance episode, and Vinny was playing the Nikia deck. Nikia doubles your mana, makes all your lands tap for two mana. Mm -hmm. Vinny had a turn where he chose, he had Nikia in the uh, command zone, and he chose to play a Primordial Sage with his mana available, and then on the next turn, he played Nakia and drew a card for the Primordial Sage. And to me, and I'm going to call out Vinny a little bit, I thought that was a mistake when watching the tape back when we were working on it. I believe that he would have been in a much better position having played the Nakia mm -hmm. first. And then the following turn, you play Primordial Sage. And that only uses half your mana. And then you follow it up with another creature, draw the card then. And think of those that turn sequencing, right? In, in the first case, I have Primordial Sage, then I play Nakia, and I've drawn a card. Right. So I'm at turn, let's say, seven. I don't remember exactly what turn it is. And I have Primordial I Sage, six. Nakia, and a card. Right. If you do Nakia first, and then on the following turn, Primordial Sage and a creature, the same turns happened, but now I have Primordial Sage, Nakia, an additional creature on board, and I still drew the card. Right. Because Primordial Sage doesn't, it does cost a lot of mana, and with Nikia out the next turn, you're doubling your mana, so you could potentially play two creatures. You still get the card draw that you would have gotten if you played Nikia after you played Primordial Sage, but... Now you have a Nikki that can bash in that you're less afraid to use. I mean, there's just a lot of different things here that make that sequencing a little bit better. Right. So I think that, you know, and that's really easy to do in a game is to sort of sequence it, pr prioritizing just slightly, I believe, uh, the less efficient play. And, you know, obviously, Vinny was thinking in his head, I want when I cast Nakia to draw a card off of it. Mm -hmm. But I think it would have been a little bit better because we knew he had an additional creature in his hand because he plays one the I think he plays two the very next turn. Right. And so he had one more creature. So yes, you might be down one additional card, but you're also in a deck with 60 creatures or whatever. You're likely to draw a card or draw a creature off the card you draw and chain and stuff chain together. them together. And yeah. I think in that case, you're much better uh, in a better position if you just have more mana available to you to chain more, th to cast more things. Yeah. I, Marari's Wake is a card that's in a lot of my decks, yeah. and it's the absolute number one priority in my hand to cast mo almost always when I draw it. Get it out as soon as you can because it makes you double your plays from then out. Yeah, right? Think about it this way, too. So if you added up all the mana you were able to generate in a game, and let's say by turn five you're going to play one of these two spells. All right, if you play the spell that doubles your mana, that means the next turn you're going to get, let's say, 10 if you don't hit your land drops, and then the next turn you have another 10. If you didn't do that, you're going to have that same equation but minus 5 because you're each only going to each turn. Yeah. yeah, well, the turn that you didn't have it out. So if you wasted a turn, you're essentially, let's say at the end, okay, I was able to generate 25 mana as opposed to 20. You're always going to want to take the 25 amount, almost, almost, always. Yeah, it's a big difference. I mean, that's a, a 5 drop is going to make an impact on the game, and that's an additional 5 drop or mm -hmm. not, depending on when you play that that ramp spell. All right, and so the last uh, sort of bullet point under the improper sequencing category is thinking ahead. So we alluded to this a little bit later, but a lot of times when I'm looking at my hands, there'll be a card that it would maybe be better to play later. Mm -hmm. Like let's say I'm on turn two and I have, I don't know, Demonic Tutor or maybe even, a, you know, like a Doomblade type I think removal good, spell. Yeah. And, and usually it's like, ah, there's not a lot of big threats or whatever. But I also look at my hand and I see I have a three drop. I have a four drop. I have a five drop. You know, a lot of times I'm going to fire off the spell knowing that my next three turns are kind of mapped out. Like there's not any extra mana in that. Right. When I'm looking at my plan, I'm looking ahead and being like, I'm not going to have any extra mana to cast this spell for a while. This is a window where I'm not going to use the mana otherwise. I'd rather use the spell than be sitting here and I wasted that two mana, and now I'm on turn six. Right. I've also seen people do this with cards like like a Hermit Druid-esque effect, a card that says, like, I might be able to win the game off of this, and they're like, fine, I'll play it out in turn two. And if someone gets rid of it, that's fine. But a lot of times it's also like, I'm going to play this out in the next turn. Watch, I'm not going to use it. And very slowly you're kind of actually hiding the card by the fact that you're just not using it. And I think, honestly, playing out crazy threats early on is sometimes better than not, just because of the way that politics I've seen at least work around the tables you get the threat assessment is going to jump to someone else 
right? And you don't want, I think it's almost like hot potato. You don't yeah. want to be the last person holding the potato when everyone decides that the game is over and it's time to start bashing in. <laughs> you want to be the person to grab the potato and throw it to someone else as soon as possible. So I, I like thinking about, you know, your, see, not just what I'm playing this turn, but if I don't do it now, where's my window of opportunity to do it in the future? Do I have a bunch of extra mana laying around or am I right. looking at my hand going like, I know I'm gonna play my commander next turn. And then after that, I have the land, I'm gonna hit, you know, I have a five drop, so I'm gonna play that, you know, and then after that, you know, you might even be able to map out three or four turns roughly, you know, you're gonna draw cards and that might change, but in general, if everything goes well, I'm probably not gonna have extra mana. So right now I do, uh, I'd rather use it than not. Yep. All right, let's go on, on to the next category of uh, gameplay mistakes that we've seen and I've made and Josh has made less of in the world. Oh, I've made a lot. <laughs> well, this one's actually one of the ones that we've talked about quite a bit on the show, and that's just bad threat assessment. Um, and again, you know, we talked about, we, we, we saw a lot of people talking about this on our last Game Nights episode, but decks in general, you build answers into your decks. Like I have three single target removal spells. I have maybe four to five board wipes. That's eight cards out of 99 the chance of you drawing them are not great, but you will see them throughout the course of the game. But the question is, is whether or not you're going to use your target removal for something, and is it worth that thing being removed by that particular spell? And I think in general, unless it's absolutely winning the other person the game, you can kind of let some things slide. I mean, we've talked about before how a lot of threat assessment is absolutely knowing what's happening with the thing. Mm -hmm. And so the longer you can wait, the better it is. Uh, that's why instant speed is so important. Right. But you see a lot of players where they remove something and you're like, I, that, I wouldn't even use that at all. Yeah, and maybe that doesn't affect me at all. I'm totally fine with that being on the board. And maybe there's nothing on the table I would even use a removal spell on right now. And therefore maybe I'll hold on to it. Mm -hmm. um, or uh, often you see something you're like, well, that's not even the worst thing that's on the table. You know, and, and in our playgroup, we would usually say, like, I would kill that. Maybe you want to kill that thing over there. Um, yeah, we have we have a tar Everyone has the, the text redirect target spell on them. Yeah. To, like, a minor degree. <laughs> Every human at the table does. But you see it a lot in games, I think, and, and people have written to us sort of complaining that, like, my playgroup has really bad threat assessment. And I think that is a true statement. Like, in general, a lot of players, one of the bigger mistakes they make is not being able to identify what the threat is at any right. given moment or when that threat is sort of critical. Um, yeah, like it's charging up. Also, I've seen a lot of people misidentify what kind of removal to use on certain things. Someone will have destroy a target creature with a card like Doomblade, but really they should have saved that for something. Or or they had an exile effect. It's like you should have had that kill the thing that has a, when it enters the, when it hits the graveyard effect on it. Right. So we've seen a lot of that happen. I've done it a lot myself. Again, the, the biggest example that we have is when DJ chose to point his exile effect his at utter end. his utter end at Vinny's Mana Gorger as opposed to my Planar Bridge. And it's true that in the moment it did threaten DJ with a lot of damage and he felt he was compelled to use it. But a lot of people point out in the comments, you know, maybe he should have pointed at that planar bridge instead. And the threat assessment there is interesting because the planar bridge isn't directly immediately threatening anyone, but overall power level and what it can do, well, the sky's the limit with a card like that, as opposed to a man Gordon or Hydra, which you know the power and toughness of, you know your life total, you can actually compute what's about to happen. But for something as unknown as planar bridge, perhaps it would have been better. At least here's how I know it would have been better. I 100% did not want. You were like, that "Don't to kill happen. my planar bridge! Don't kill my yeah. planar bridge!" Yeah. And so when it went after the mana gorger hydra, I was like, "Sweet, that's exactly what I wanted." Yeah. Uh, the setup, in case you were not familiar, in the last game nights, Vinny was swinging at DJ with a 12-12 mana gorger hydra, which has trample, and Jimmy had a planar bridge that he had played the turn before, so he was tapped out and he uh, hadn't been able to use it yet. And so when Vinny attacked DJ, there was some discussion that occurred where DJ kind of tried to talk Vinny out of it. And he kind of said, I haven't answered the planar bridge. And Vinny was like, you should use it on the planar bridge. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm still attacking you. Which I think was actually a really good play by Vinny. Which yeah. is like, I'm still going to get the value of hitting someone with this right now. Right, and he couldn't hit you because he'd made a deal. It was all kinds of politics going on, obviously. But DJ did choose to utter end the Mana Gorger Hydra, which Mana Gorger Hydra is like a big, dumb creature. And yes, it's big and yes, it's dumb and it does do damage. But at the same time, in your deck you have many answers to big dumb creatures. Right. Other creatures are answers to creatures. You could just mm -hmm. stack block it for a while. You know, it has, it. It has trample, but there are ways around it. Planar Bridge is a card where like somebody uses it one time, you could potentially lose the game. Like they can get 
omniscience or something with mm -hmm. it, which you didn't have in your deck. But there's many things that can re go horribly wrong if a uh, planar bridge is activated even a single time. So to me, yeah, in that moment, I think it's crazy to get rid of the Mana Gorge or Hydra. And that, that was just, you know, I think improper threat assessment, which we've all done, not begging on DJ at all here. Because again, in the moment, it's easy to be like, well, I really don't want to take that damage. Yeah. But the damage knocks you down to 22 life or whatever. The Planar Bridge knocks you out of the game. Yeah. And this, this is the other question that I'm, I don't know if DJ was asking himself in the moment, but this is something I often ask myself if I feel like I'm the only person at the table with the answer to the problem, which is, is someone else likely to kill it if you don't? Now, if it affects the rest of the table as much as more than you, like it's a card that says, like, stop X kind of deck, and you're not playing that deck, then you don't need to be the person that answers this. You could be the person that tells everyone to answer it, right. in which case that's even better for you because if someone else is obligated to answer it, that's card disadvantage for them and the person they're answering it from. And if you have a card like Utter End that says exile permanence, right, like non-land permanence, then you're going to want to hold on to that for the right moment for the right thing because artifacts, enchantments, and cards like that are much harder to get rid of in general than creatures. Yeah, I think if DJ was in a different spot at the table, it might have made more sense uh, but the problem was it was like Vinny's turn and Vinny went right before you and mm -hmm. I hadn't answered it because I'd been mana screwed and couldn't basically do anything. And Vinny had straight up said, I don't have an answer to it. Right. So it was like, do you let it, you untap? Does, do you let Jimmy untap with it or not? So yeah. Yeah. Cause I agree totally. A lot of times threat assessment is not just, does that need to go? It's also, when does it need to go? And do I have to be the one to make it go? And right. you want to move those levers as much as possible towards like, I'm not going to use this unless I have to. Um, so so be stingy with your removal is good. And I think, you know, again, in the DJ example, even if he'd just been stingy with it, taken the 12 and waited, that would have still been better because I think he would have seen, okay, I got to get rid of the planar bridge. Right. And that's some political or, maneuvering for him too. Like I got rid of this Vinny, promise not to swing at me with that right. thing again. Yeah, I think he was trying to pull that and Vinny was like, no, because if you have a way to destroy the planar bridge, You're you gonna should use do it. Anyway. it. Yeah. Which yeah. I, I I thought was like, that's a really good play by Vinny in general. Yeah. Uh, well, let's say in this situation, <laughs> yeah, it did. Backfire for everyone but me. But let's say, for instance, you did have a removal spell for that, you know, for the card in your hand. And in that case at the table, knowing that I'm not going to get out an omniscience or something that's going to immediately win the game, do you think that you would have used it? If, uh, if you, you mean think... me being me in that scenario? Yeah, being mana screwed. Because oh. you're not the biggest target at the table, right? Right. I think so. Planar Bridge is particularly scary. Just it's that scary. any card, right? Like, just any permanent in your deck is just a little too... It's like tutor and cheap mana cost. It's true. little too crazy. Um, I think if... Let's say it was a Blightsteel Colossus. Mm-hmm. In that case, I think I would let it sit because it's unlikely to swing at me. Right. But Planar Bridge is too likely to get something that just destroys everybody. And, and as it went, it did, you know, it was an Emrakul, which is not that bad compared to what it could have been. But Pretty at the same cool, time, actually. it did matter. Um, but yeah. Uh, there's another thing I wanted to point to here in Threat Assessment. And I don't see players do this enough. Let's be honest. Not all commanders are created equal. Not all decks are created equal. A lot of times you sit down at the table, you know a particular deck or maybe two of the decks are stronger than the right. other decks. You know, sometimes it's your deck. But even some... just purely based off the commander, not even knowing what's in the deck. Right. You sit down at certain tables, look at the commanders and be like, okay, well, that deck is likely a notch or two above the rest of the decks. Right. That is something you have threat assessed and you should take action on. We had a game the other day that made me think of this where we played with Kyle Hill. Kyle makes pretty strong decks and always claims that they're not strong. That's a shout out to Kyle because I know he listens. Um, he was playing a Silvala deck. Right. I was playing a Nekusar deck. You had your Anna Fenza deck and somebody's playing Lord Windgrace. Jimmy and I know that our decks are not our most powerful and they're like a yeah. notch below... Probably two notches below Silvala and one below Lord Windgrace. Well, I certainly can't make like 15 mana on turn three. Right. So. And, you know, they're fine. The decks are fine. And I was fine playing this game. It's not like I want all the decks to exactly be on the same power level. Just within a couple of points is totally fine. You just know you're at a slight disadvantage to begin with. My answer to this was to be like, this Evolve deck is stronger than the rest of the decks. And I held... So it was like, you know, everybody went... And I held a counter spell open for turn three when Kyle went to cast Silvala. And I just countered his Silvala. And I just went, yep, that deck's stronger than everybody else. I'm just trying to give it a speed bump early so we can all right. catch up and i remember i said that to you and you were like when i countered it you were like oh that deck must be good 
Yeah. Because there's no, no way Josh would do that. Yeah, and it's a counterspell, right? I've seen you, you win games because you had a counterspell in your hand. So if you're countering a commander on turn three, which is, by the way, you uh, very rarely do I actually see this happen. It made me go, okay, this deck is very strong. And, if, and Josh it, is scared of it. <laughs> Josh, If Josh is scared of it, I should be scared of it. And if Kyle's not even complaining that much about it, then he understands as well why it had to be done. So in my mind, I, I also put a card, like basically set aside the card in my hand being like, okay, I got to deal with Kyle at some point. I need to make sure I have answers for that. And it was a great game, and we managed to like keep it pretty even. Yeah. And a lot of like haymakers were thrown, but that was enough of a speed bump, and everybody knowing like, okay, we got to watch out for that deck, set the tone correctly right out the gate. And I think if you sit down at the table and you know one of the decks is stronger than the rest of the decks, first of all, point it out to everybody else, but also that's a point to be ready. Do something about it. Don't yeah, just know don't it. Don't be afraid. Like so many people, they sit down, oh, that deck's so strong, and then they don't play any differently. Yeah, I guess this is also an example of good threat assessment, right? Understanding when you need to play a card that is typically one of the stronger cards in your deck against a deck that can recast their commander. That's right. But at the same time, even that small turn advantage there is going to be big, especially when the deck is closer to a CEDH level where it's able to go off in absurd ways on turns, you know, three, four, five, and all that. All of a sudden, you push that back to seven, eight, nine, and now you've got a chance because, right. you know, eight, maybe your eight, deck nine, is... 10 is around the point where you might have a chance right. to go off and you've even the playing field. But yeah, that's a, that's a big lesson, I think, is once you proper threat assess, do something about it. Don't just complain somebody's deck is stronger than yours. Yeah. Be ready to answer their stuff more than other people's. Put your words into action, players. All right, the third point under biggest mistakes that uh, commander players make in gameplay is missing a key interaction. Boy, I can't tell you how many times we I'm, have done this. I'm really bad at by this. By accident, <laughs> how many times something has happened and we go, oh, whoa, whoa, we got to rewind like three turns because this, we shouldn't have missed this. But sometimes you don't get to do that. On game nights, we have a thing where we have a judge there and we will not allow rules mistakes so like miss trick we want the judge to perform as if they're magic online or magic arena where right. the triggers pop up you're aware of them but we do allow play mistakes so we allow you to make bad decisions or mm -hmm. bad strategical choices and i take advantage of that second part as much as humanly possible um one of the things i'm talking about is again in the last game nights jimmy had an emrakul that he got with planar bridge so cool Vinny attacked with a 12 12 flyer Jimmy fl basically flashes out the Emrakul with the planar bridge, blocks. Emrakul's a 13-13. Now Emrakul's taken 12 damage. I have a Judith on the board. I have a Bloodgast. I have a High Market. I could easily have sacked my Bloodgast to the High Market. Judith deals the one point of damage to Emrakul. And boom, my Emrakul, just like that, is gone. The card, by the way, that pretty much won me the game outside of the extra turns. Yeah, I think we're probably still in trouble. You played a million extra turns. But at the same time, that was a big reason why. That that contributed like 50 points of damage over all oh, these yeah. extra turns. I, I think everyone actually stood a kind of an actual chance of that ha if, if that Emrakul was gone. Because I, maybe I would have been able to get rid of one player, maybe two. But at the very least, it gives you another shot to being back in the game. So a really big mistake on my part, something that I missed. And, you know, it's the type of mistake that, I'll be honest, I make that type of mistake very often where I'm looking at the board two turns later and being like, oh, uh, crap. Yeah. I forgot about an ability or a trigger or a sequence a that I have access bad. to yeah. that could have changed something, and now it's too late because the turn has moved on and blah, blah, blah. And that, I think, is a play mistake that you can be better at preventing. And, and the big way to do it is when something happens, just take a moment and take stock of your available resources. What are my triggers? What do I have in my hand? Just look. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do I really have nothing I can do? Because have I've done this a lot too, where it's like I sort of forget about a counter spell that's in my hand. <laughs> where it's just like oh, that means you're playing too many counter spells, Josh. No, no, no. no it's I'm just, just like I'm playing not enough, right? Because yeah. I'm not. It's like oh, I'm going to save this for later. In my mind, something bad happens. Two turns later, I'm like oh, I should have just countered that. Why thing. did I counter that? Yeah. Yeah, but in the moment, I was just like not thinking about it in that way. Uh, another play mistake in the same episode I want to point out. So I actually think I made a bigger play mistake than the Emrakul thing. Uh, on the, the turn before, I had sacked my blood gas and dealt one damage to Tamio. Right. And then I played high market, got blood gas back into play. And then I had to discard for a turn because I had too many cards because I'd been missing uh, land drops. I had mana screwed. Everyone noticed I discarded a mana crypt. Mm -hmm. They asked me why. Well, Lavinia, the new Lavinia was in play, and you can't cast spells that you don't pay mana for they get with Lavinia in play. I'm mana screwed. I'm discarding a mana crypt. 
Why wasn't my play sack the blood gas deal one damage to Lavinia, bring it back with high market, sack, sack it, deal the, the second market. damage to Lavinia? Because Judith, when things die, she pings. Kill Lavinia, play my mana crypt. Now I'm set up. Now I didn't get another turn because Jimmy ended up winning, but I didn't know that at the time. So playing my mana crypt gives me all of a sudden two extra mana on my next turn and kind of has right. a chance to get me back in the game, which I think was a bigger play mistake than, than the Emrakul thing. I think the fact that I was missing land drops and mana screwed just sort of, I, I, I started paying attention to the directorial part of my brain. Yeah. I was like, I'm out of this game. Episode, I don't yeah. have a chance to win. Let me just make sure that the play is happening in the way that's going to make it easiest for us when we're editing. You know, honestly, that happens so much when you do get man screwed. And I'm speaking as someone who has seen that from experience. But at the same time, a part of my brain also goes, well, if you're going to go out, go out guns blazing, do as much damage as you can on the way out. So you kind of actually restructure the way you look at your hand. But it's true. You should, you should understand what's in your hand at all times. And if you want to take this to the next step, Try and figure out what your opponents have on their board, you know? At, at that moment, right, had DJ gone, whoa, whoa, Josh, Josh, you can kill the Emrakul right now. Why don't you just, yeah, you know, ping it for one more time? It would have 100% have happened. Yep. But I think it's, it's you know, and DJ said this on the podcast, but he it's very hard to play on camera sometimes. There's a lot of different factors that you're putting in. But it's not just on camera. We miss this stuff all the time. I wish I could say it was just on camera, but there's yeah. tons of games where I've been in, and I'm just like, Whoops. You know, your, your brain just like in a down moment while somebody else is thinking, l thinks back to two turns ago and you're yeah. like, ah, oh, why did I think of that? I could have just done that and this would all be different. Yeah. And everyone out there's done it. And I think just being in the moment cognizant of like being aware of what your resources are, what's in your hand, you know, just running that program of like double check all my triggers, all my abilities, my cards. Okay. Yeah, you'll see pro players do this all the time, right? They'll look through their graveyard really fast. Is there anything in there that they can do? Or even like, what are the, my outs I can draw to? And they'll put it down. Okay, they'll look at all the cards. You can do... It, there's a lot of times in a game when I know my hand, I know my deck, I know my board. What am I going to do? Look at my phone? Or yeah. I can start looking around the table, see whether people are playing, how many cards everyone has in their hand, what their commanders do, what the threats are right now, who can actually deal with what. And what resources they have so I might be able to tip them off. Yeah, and that is huge political advantage as well because you're going to be able to help other players play better in the case where, you know, obviously we don't want, you don't want to help someone win, but you do want to help someone else if they can stop someone else from winning super hard. Right, if they can team up with you yeah. to win. There was um, a couple of examples that I wanted to pull out. One is in the Guild of Ravnica Game Nights episode, we had this crazy stack, but basically Elish Norn was out for Craig, mm -hmm. and I had Teferi's Protection in my hand, and I was trying to come up with some way to use that to get around Elish Norn, but it doesn't really, right? Because any time your stuff comes back in, it just dies to Elish Norn right. anyway. But... Adam played a Dictate of Erebos, which allowed me to play like a mini board wipe and then Teferi's Protection in in response before the Elish Norn was even down. And what we did fail to notice was that, because what was going to happen is uh, some of Adam's creatures would die, which would force other people to sacrifice creatures, mm -hmm. and they would therefore sacrifice the Elish Norn. And by the time I came back from Teferi's, Teferi's Protection, it would be gone. Right. But a lot of people noticed uh, in the comments and something we didn't even think about at the time was that Adam had a sack outlet on board. And so in response to me casting... Teferi's protection. He, he could have sacked his creatures before Dictator of Erebos even came out to allow Craig to keep the Elish Norn. Mm -hmm. And it was a complicated thing that you would have to see. Like I said, in the moment, we didn't even see it. But that was the type of thing that Craig or Olivia could have pointed out to Adam. You know, and again, I'm not blaming them or anything. I'm just saying, like, that's another reason to pay attention to what effects your opponents have available to them because they could have teamed up in that moment made a big difference too. It would have destroyed my entire board and yeah. I was way ahead in that game. And, and what happened is I was able to pull off the Teferi's protection thing and then it was just a snowball rolling downhill. It was no stopping me. Um, but if they had reset me right then, then the game's back to parity and I think everyone has a chance. Yeah. So that is a really good advice is pay attention to what your opponents have at their disposal because there might come a point where they need to use it and you need, you know, they're not even aware because things get complicated. It's a complicated game. Very, very complicated. Okay. Um, oh, right. Don't forget onboard effects and triggers when you do something. Like me, when I tapped a bunch of mana and had to sack all my lands and immediately lost the game. <laughs> to your own price of glory. I was already losing the game before that. <laughs> That's true. I certainly put the icing on the cake myself, my own birthday cake. Oh, it's so complicated. I, I listed that moment uh, at the end of the Commander 2018 uh, game nights where 
I forgot archetype of imagination. I was oh, only right. thinking in terms of like when I kill it, my creatures get flying back. Forgot that Kyle's creatures would also get flying back. Right. And so I thought I had the win and I just, he just like, I block and I'm like, oh yeah, you get yeah. flying too. Crap. <laughs> yeah. There's also that time that you could have won by playing a, I think it was a blood rush creature on an attack. Yes. And it was in your hand. The answer was there all along. But sometimes I think we get caught up in the moments. We look at one card way too hard. And we're like, how is this going to save me while the rest of the board exists? So try to um, not get too much tunnel vision in that case. Think of all those mistakes we just listed. That's like five or six, most yeah. of them by me. Where Publicly. Where literally everyone knows. Yeah. <laughs> where literally it's a it's a an option you had that you just didn't see. Yeah. And so that's telling you need to look closer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Next bullet point. Lack of recon. <laughs> Tightening my goggles to reconnaissance. So uh, reconnaissance, uh, not the card, but like the military tactic of scouting out ahead to try and discern what the lay of the battlefield is, what mm -hmm. your opponents are trying to do, you know, how they're arraying their forces, where they are exactly in comparison to you. This is very Art of War you right now, by the way. Correct, very Sun Tzu. It's really predicting what your opponents are going to do. And that's like a huge part of strategy in general, right? Mm -hmm. Don't become so focused only on your own board Pay attention to the plays of your opponents. So this goes along with paying attention to what resources they have and triggers and things, but also not just what they have that maybe you can use. Right. Also, what they're trying to do. Right. Yeah, what's their game plan? What's their deck trying to do? Why did they play that card out first and just pass the turn very quickly? Yeah, they're thinking beings. They're like you. They're sequencing in a specific way. Right. They're trying to set things up so that the dominoes will fall in their favor. Figuring out, based on what they're doing, what's likely to happen next or where their moves are going to be or what they're going to be towards is a huge part of navigating towards a win. Yeah. And also making sure other players at the table understand what's going on as well. Because a lot of times, I don't know how many times I've done this against you now, Josh. You'll start doing something and everyone's like, la -da -da, everything's You're great. You're like, no, guys. Guys, guys, say. stop. Everyone stop. Look and just listen to me. Please trust me. Things are awful. <laughs> the wool is being pulled over your eyes because he passed the turn so quickly and you're all focused on that thing. But really what we should be looking at is this. And I wrote down, use your social skills. Silent players are at a disadvantage here. You know, a big way to figure out what your opponents are doing, ask them. Yeah, that's true. Oh, what's that for? Yeah. Wait, do you have so-and-so in your deck? Oh, who are you attacking with that next turn is a really big one. I like that a lot, actually. Yeah. Who's that going at? You know, it could be a creature, it could be a planeswalker, whatever. You know, what are you going to do with that? A lot of times the answer is like, ah, oh, it's not coming at you. You're okay. like, okay, great. All right, good. And everyone else at the table all of a sudden is like, boop, 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 like their little antennas are buzzing. Right. So you, you don't have to talk a ton to be uh, effective at this, but... Your reconnaissance, it's not like sending your scouts over that hill. Sometimes yeah. it's like sending my uh, my emissaries, my my uh, ambassadors, which is me talking to you right. and figuring out, right. you know, reading between the lines about what's going to happen. It's like in Game of Thrones when they all go meet Daenerys at the top. It's like it's like everyone can watch what's happening in the meeting to hear what's happening, but you don't have to necessarily be a part of the meeting. Right. You, know? <laughs> you can read the body language and the other things and sort of, if they shake hands, will you sort of know something? Yeah, like, you wait know, a minute. In some respects, something of what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another thing that you have instant recon on is when someone uses a public tutor. So a mystical tutor, a tutor that looks up for a search a specific card type or a card that will use their ability to look at the top four cards of your library and you reveal the creature among them. That information is public and it's known. And that card, you know, it's great in MTG Arena. When something is revealed, it'll sit in their hand upside down. So you can see the card and it'll sit there separately. So you'll always know that it's there. And you'll see players in tournaments writing down all the cards after they cast a duress or a card that reveals their opponent's hands. It'll do it for cards in your library too if you know like yeah, the bottom three cards. Yeah, if you in a specific yeah. way, yeah, which is really, really valuable, but more valuable because you know that that player has that card. You can play around it. You can do things specifically because of it. You can try and force that card out of their hand. That recon is really valuable. Like if someone has a Cyclonic Rift and they're going to overload it, I've done this before while well, purposely play out a creature that hasn't entered the battlefield effect. Right. Because you're going to get it again when they cast that spell eventually. But I'm not going to play out this creature that makes a token. Right. You know, so there's a lot of different small things here. But you can use that advantage to force your player, to, that player to use the card or at least tell everyone like, hey, they have this. Don't do that. You know, so there's lots of different things you can do. Or even withholding information so that when your player, when a player does say they're going to do something, you know it's going to affect them if they cast it. So don't say anything. So there's a lot that Recon can do for you here. Yeah, I think, I think also... Thinking back to 
previous games you've played because we a lot of, of us play in play groups with the same people and mm-hmm. it's like well how did i know that kyle savala deck is so good well i i first you've, of all i know <laughs> kyle and i know savala's decks like i've seen djs i've seen cassius's i never played against kyle's but i know that deck's very very good and that's right. the way he likes to build decks and so when you start to see things you can put together the pieces of what's trying to happen based on like well last time i played against the deck i lost to this type of thing or mm-hmm. you know similar type decks I've played against, this is what they're trying to do. And so likely to be the next play is something that's going to be a huge creature that allows them to tap for a million mana. You know, How let's be ready that? for it, right. guys. I just don't want anybody to be taken by surprise because that's where we really get in huge trouble. Mm-hmm. So just know this is about to happen something like this. And are we prepared? That can help. That can help the table a lot and really put you in a position to win where if it was by something happens by surprise, you're totally going to lose. Be prepared. All right. The um, next point, the next biggest mistake that uh, you're probably making, and I make this one often too, is becoming the threat. So remember, you're looking at your opponent's boards. You're figuring out what triggers and abilities they have, so maybe you can point them in the right direction when they miss something, but you're also trying to discern what their strategy is, what sequence of plays they're leading towards, what they're setting up, what's likely to happen. Mm -hmm. They're doing that to you. Right. Then they should be. Right. Uh, On some level, they are. I mean, some players, I'd say the the lesser experienced players, you have to hit them over with the hammer before they're really scared of you. They're like, oh, wow, that was such an awful thing. And even though someone warned me about it, I didn't realize how bad it was till it happened. But or here, like, you know, your board's just covered with cards. Like, it doesn't take yeah. much to be like, look at that person. They're ahead. They got a million things. Right, right. And, and it's almost better if you don't understand what's happening because all you know is that it is scary. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, I, I think this happens naturally in every game, right? Which is that everyone's always looking around to see who's winning. And it's pretty obvious for the most part when someone is winning or doing a lot on the table. Right. And uh, I've used that to my advantage to help hide myself becoming the threat. But it, in general, it should be pretty obvious. When you're doing something that's impactful, you can't just hide from it. Your card is on the table. It's face up and everyone knows what it is. When you play a Mirari's Wake, you can't go, but I'm not going to do anything. Right. It's like, no, well, you, even though you didn't do anything right now, it's I play that card. The potential for next turn is vastly bigger than anything else anyone at the table can do. Well, think of when you play with very experienced players, though. Their threat assessment is so refined that it's it can be scary because, in general, one of the things that more experienced players will leverage against newer players is the ability to obfuscate their threat level. Right. So they'll play things that don't look as threatening. Mirari's Wake is not that threatening to a newer player, maybe, because it doesn't attack or block or do anything, whereas... A more experienced player is going to be like, that thing is way more scary than the 6 6 that's out. Right. You know? Even more experienced players may be like, well, yeah, but that person's got Ristic Study and has drawn 20 cards. Mm-hmm. They're probably more scary even than the person with Mirari's Wake. And so the threat assessment from different skill level players can really vary. And I think that's one of the things you got to keep in mind. How can you play to the table on their experience level and keep your threat level below the top threat? You generally don't want to be the most threatening player until you're ready to win the game to, or to take it. You know, I'm ready to handle what they're going to throw after me, throw at me. So I'm going to play this thing. Mm-hmm. That's definitely going to make me the threat, but I've set it up in such a manner that I still have, have some mana available and a card or two in my hand to protect what I'm trying to do. Or I've right. set up, I've set up some onboard things that are going to make it hard for them to interact with with what I'm doing, that kind of stuff. Yeah, That's really one of the keys to Commander, I believe, is like setting things up and playing in such a way that when you do become the threat, it's hard for them to have seen it coming, A, they're not ready for it, and B, at that point, to overcome it. I've seen a lot of times where all it takes is that you have one way to answer the first person that tries to stop you. Yeah. So it's like you're able to play, let's just say your Commander is the threat and you will win the game, most likely if you play this. You play your commander without any counter magic up, they get rid of it, sets you back. Now, if you waited a couple of turns or you ramped out a little bit, you can play your commander with counter spell backup. Oftentimes, that is enough. Yeah. Uh, and, and if you have two layers past that, then you are really ready to become the threat. You almost um, never see the third layer necessary. Sometimes I, the I second is yeah. needed, but very rarely. Yeah. You, you, I've seen a couple of counter spell wars in our entire careers, but. Yeah, it's true. You would think you have seen more, it, but. It's not that often. It's not that often, right. Um. And the thing is, too, when you're becoming the threat, you have to be really careful, again, just not to overextend. Because 
I think it's better if you're trying to ramp up into being the threat. You, you want to do so in a way that doesn't make you the king of the hill immediately. Yeah. Because let's say you're like, cool, all I need to do is play this spell and wait one full turn rotation. If nothing happens to me, then I'll be fine. Much better to do smaller things building up to that. And then when you have the mana available and you have the ability to do so, then you go for the big all out play. I mean, we've all been in games, and I think this happens in actually most commander games, where somebody early has an explosive turn, but isn't able to capitalize on it because they just do it a little too early, can't protect yeah. it. Or everyone immediately turns on them and stops them, right? Think of how much ahead you have to be to overcome your three opponents, right? Not only are they all drawing a card, so that's three cards to your one. They're mm -hmm. all dropping a land, so that's three mana to your one. And they are all going to use their mana, so it could be like 15 mana tier 5. How many cards do they have in their hand? It might be 18 cards to your 7. Right. You know, that, it might, it's, it, yeah, it's all the stuff. They may be, let's say you have 9 mana, but they all have 7. That's 21 mana to your 9. Mm -hmm. Think of the odds that are stacked against you and how bad it is to be the overwhelming th threat, the big, you know, everyone team up against the person. It's mostly correct to stay close. Second place, or if you are in first place, it to be close enough that like the other players don't feel like well if we team up on them Jimmy's right behind him so yeah it's not be gonna, awful yeah, yeah exactly right. so well, let's let hope the two of those fight bring each other down and then we can catch up you yeah. don't you, you know in general those big explosive early turns get you into the position where like it's three v one that Joda episode with the brawl right where you had a crazy turn think of how far ahead you were but at the same time we were able to come back in that game by working together so be really careful about overextending because a lot of times we see this too. Big, huge board, pretty early. Couple of board wipes later, you're totally out of it. You're down to two cards. You, yeah, yeah, you, you, you fired left. all your bullets. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's why Expropriate just wins games again, right? You, if you're able to take two, three extra turns or take two, three permanents from your opponents, that's completely taking away the advantage of them drawing more cards than you and stuff, and that puts you at a super far ahead. Well, think of Expropriate is a natural answer available to you. You do the thing. And then you untap and have another turn. Right. So you don't even need the extra mana necessarily to protect what you just did. It naturally protects what you just did. Card's crazy. Card is crazy. Um, and even if you're the main threat, you may not be able to. T uh, you may not be able. Like you may be the arch enemy, and you may not be able to like make politic deal, political deals as well. Like at this point, who's gonna listen to you if you're like, hey, do this or whatever? But sometimes there is one person at the table who is willing to make a deal, and that person might be the one that's mana screwed. So a lot of different ups and downs of becoming the threat. But when you're in that position, I found a lot of times if I'm the mana screwed person, I'm like, hey, my life is yours. Just don't kill me first. And that gives you a better chance. And as the person as the main threat, as long as you're like, all right, I know, as long as I know I can deal with you if it comes to it, I'll happily make that deal. Yeah, because 2v1 is way better than 3v1. Yeah. Yeah, but I think that's a big mistake a lot of players make. They just don't understand, like, if I do this thing, they all are going to try to kill me, and I don't have the power at the moment to withstand, yeah. you know, the combined forces of my of my opponents. All right. Today's end steps going to be great based on all this stuff, by the way. <laughs> um, all right, and this last one Oh, you is... have your own... Wait, oh, sorry, you have your own end step. I, I thought you didn't come up with one. Oh, do you have it? You have one? Yeah, but it's... That's okay, it, we can do it, yours. Mine oh, can be done anytime. Sure, okay. Okay, uh, but this last point is one oh, that you yes. added. Yes, this one, I think, is one of the most... Okay. In general, <laughs> important points of Magic the Gathering and actually games in general. Yep. Playing to your outs. Uh, what this means is essentially figuring out how am I going to win this game and how am I going to get that accomplished. Or what? how is it possible, possible. for me to yeah. win this game? Yeah. How is my deck built to do this? What is my goal here? Has it changed what my out is in this game? And how am I going to achieve that as quickly as possible or as best as possible? So a very common way to think about this is let's say Josh is at 150 life, right? Now your outs are not taking him to zero. Maybe your outs are commander damage, infect damage, milling, any number of things. But figure out in games what your out is and learn how to play towards that. And that's going to affect a lot of stuff, especially when we're talking about it's turn three. What are you going to play? Are you playing to your out if you do this? Or are you playing something because... You just, you just wanted to play the spell. You weren't thinking about it. I think you should constantly be asking yourself this question. How am I going to win this game? Yeah. What's your plan to win the game? Is it to set up your own little synergy lock and play this card? Is it to mm -hmm. you know attack somebody to death? Is it to whatever? I think later in the game, it becomes even more focused as far as like you can kind of get down off in, in games where it's like, well, I got to find this card. Yeah. Or I got to play this, hope it doesn't get destroyed, and then play that. And that's what gives me the, the chance. Or, you know, <laughs> you can get down to very specific outs sometimes. If you're not thinking about what it is that's going to lead you towards 
winning the game, sometimes you won't make correct plays. Like you won't chump block. Yeah. You know, in time. Or you will chump block, but you need that creature because it's part of one of your only outs. I've seen that before where it's like, ugh. Why did I block? Yeah. Ugh, I, I have 40 life. I should have just taken the hit. Yeah, exactly. Or even if it brings me down to two. Right. You know, But have, that's the only way you're going to win in this situation. Right. right. I have no other answer, and I need that creature to team up for the synergy or whatever. Yeah. Be sure you know what your out is, but otherwise you risk getting rid of part of it. Yeah, and you're making that decision about your out constantly. So like you said, they're going to swing at me for 25 and I'm down to two. Well, does it really matter if you chump now? Because they're probably going to swing at you for the next turn for 30 and you'll be dead. So should you just take the damage, hope they don't have anything else because you need that one extra turn and that creature? You know, look at your deck. You know your deck list as well. And there's a lot of times when you're man screwed or whatever, you're looking at your hand and you're like, well, this isn't the only thing I can do. So I'm just going to focus on this. I'm just going to do this and pass the turn. Whereas it could have been, hey, look, if I draw three lands in a row, unlikely but possible i will be able to enact this plan and this plan's outcome is so much better than me just resigning myself to what i have in my hand that i should always be taking that in that case because otherwise what are you doing you're just delaying the inevitable oh there are a lot of games where your chances to win by the end are pretty long shots like that's just the way commander works people yeah. get into very commanding positions by the end of the game but don't cut off your ability for the long shot to happen because there's a lot of times you make a you take a line where mm -hmm. it's like now there's absolutely actually no chance to win. Right. Like leave yourself the out when you can. Um, it can be difficult to see, but if you're constantly thinking like, okay, this is bad. They got four Eldrazi, right? Um, so I'm going to have to draw a board wipe. Yeah, I have to get to a board wipe. Right? I'm going to have to draw the board wipe. So I got to play as if I am going to draw it because if I don't, I'm going to lose, mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. And, and that doesn't mean that you're resigning yourself to losing. You're just taking the only line that has a chance to win. So if you play in the manner of like, assuming I draw a board wipe, then I'm these two things I'm gonna do, right? Yeah. So it might even be like, assuming I draw a board wipe, I'm not even gonna play this creature because if I draw the board wipe, I can play it after and that gives me a chance in the game. You know, and if I don't, well, the creature didn't matter that I played it now. Yeah, so there, I was going to get annihilated regardless, yeah. right? So it, I was going to die whether I have the creature on board or not. So I might as well hold it and hope I draw that board wipe. Sometimes I've also found that if you can play to other players' outs yeah. in, in a game, right? Where it's like, hey, you know, I'm not going to win this game right now, but if I can delay just long enough for this one player to get this out, then I know they have that maybe my deck doesn't. Like maybe you don't have any way to deal with an enchantment, but you know they do. What can you do to help them get there? Because them removing that is so much better for you than, ju than just sort of giving up on the game entirely. Oh, I really, really like playing to another player's outs. For sure. Sometimes you're like, oh, like in my rune deck, let's say it has the ability to blink creatures. Oh, right. Maybe I blink a creature attacking somebody else because I have no way to deal with a certain thing, but they might. And so them being alive in the game actually gives me a better chance because right now I cannot beat that player. And at least them, maybe I have a chance to beat if they get rid of the thing. Right. Yeah. Uh, Okay, nebulous examples are tough, but I, I, I <laughs> like that idea of play, no, it makes sense, helping right? your opponents play to their outs or playing to your opponent's outs. Yeah, especially, I mean, if you're stuck between a rock and a hard place, don't give up. That's the main thing here. Know what can happen in the game. And honestly, sometimes you got to cross your fingers and I'm not going to lie, more often than not, I feel like sometimes playing to your outs, you get the thing that needs to happen because you have, you have three players. That's just players. the life Jimmy lives. Yeah, it's my life. But you have three <laughs> players at the table that are trying to stop something. You're going to have more card selection between all of you guys. At the very least, if you, if you and like we said, if you don't do it, then you're just not playing the game at all. Well, hey, if you're playing blue, you could always draw expropriate. So you always have a chance. Yeah. So if just it's... at the very least, just live as long as you can to draw as many cards so you can try and get it. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, and this actually, this next point goes against one of the points we had earlier, but I think sometimes it's better to hold on to tutors um, until you absolutely know what you need to get, unless you know what you need or you're in a situation where like, if I don't tutor to get this, like a land drop or something like important, then I know I'm going to be screwed in the long run. Because um, like a two mana tutor is way less consequential on turn nine or ten because you could tutor for the card and play it. Sometimes. You mean way more consequential? W way turn more nine. consequential, yeah. right? Because then you know the lay of the land, you know what your out is. Maybe you know for a fact that if you don't get this card right now, the game's gonna be over for everyone. Like I've I've tutored for Cyclonic Rift over and overloaded the same turn so many times. In Toxic now. Deluge is another one I get a lot because it's a cheap that you can often string together with the tutor and yeah. play. Um, yeah, I agree with this point in general. We were talking about mana efficiency before. The only time I would play a tutor early is if I'm going to waste the mana and I have a card that's, you know, Important really good enough. to get. Yeah. Like, oh, I can go get Ristic Study. That's going to set me up in such a way right. that, that that's worth getting. Um, yeah. 
And that's based on your board, based on what's in your hand. Do you need to get a card to help you out right now? Right. Um, But tutors, that's why tutors are so good. Because Mm -hmm. if you need, if you're playing to your outs, a tutor is all of your outs, right? If there's any one card you need, that's the tutor. That's true. (laughs) Yeah. All right. To the listeners, what gameplay mistakes do you often see others make or you yourself? I want to know about the ones you know about yourself. Um, That's the hard question. Yeah, that you can point out. And I think just pointing out the mistakes and your own mistakes, like me missing my (laughs) onboard triggers and abilities and forgetting to use them sometimes, that's just a hole in my game. But if I don't analyze that and admit to it and talk about it, then how can I ever fix that hole? That's right. So I think a lot of people could go through the comments and just be like, oh, yeah, I do do that. And that could help them, you know, fix a leak in their game. So please help us out by commenting, tweeting at us, emailing, all that good stuff. Yeah, and of course, you don't want to make a mistake when it comes to ordering cards online, and you can do so by going to cardkingdom.com slash command zone. You know, don't be like Josh. Don't make a mistake. Don't don't be like me. Remember that you can do buy a high market. Great land, great card. Again, use our affiliate link. It's cardkingdom.com slash command zone. And again, it's as easy as putting in the link. You're there on the website. You're going to buy these cards anyway. And by doing so, by using that link, you're directly supporting the show. You're helping us out. And don't make another mistake, which is sleeving your cards in anything other than Ultra Pro, <laughs> playing on playmats, anything other than Ultra Pro, using any sort of accoutrement that surrounds the game that is not Ultra Pro. They really do make the best stuff and the, the shiniest and coolest stuff. You know, you did a bling episode recently. Oh, yeah. Relic tokens, heavy metal dice. Look at these playmats in front yeah. of us, too. Ultra Pro really does make the stuff that make people look at your, your, uh, your battlefield and your decks and stuff and go, wow. That's cool. Yeah. Okay, now it's time for the end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. That's right. Oh, you, ah. got, you, you got it down there somewhere? No, no, I, I need to reference the rest of these things we talked about because oh, okay. today we're going to talk about Apex Legends. Ah. It's the game that everyone's playing and how all of these points actually apply to the game. So improper sequencing when you start off like, okay, Apex Legends, it's another battle royale. It's a it's first FPS, person right? sh- Yeah, it's yep. a first person shooter. It's made by the guys that made, I believe, Modern Warfare 2 and Titanfall. Um, and it's a ton of fun. Lots of people are playing it. I think they were up to 250 million players by one week. I know my nephew once said that for or recently told me he's like, Oh no, Fortnite is not cool anymore. It's all about Apex Legends. Yeah, well, trust oh. me, Fortnite's gonna stay cool <laughs> yeah, for a while. Fine. I, just, I was like, wow, things change fast. <laughs> um, but you can see actually, I don't know if you've noticed, but Fortnite has been putting out a lot of advertisements in after Apex came out. Because they lost some Join market this, share. Come yeah, you get some free stuff this way, whatever. You can almost say they're playing to their outs. <laughs> But in the game of Apex Legends, all of these things are very, very true and very real. Um, Becoming the threat, the game will literally say, you have become the new kill leader. And they'll tell the rest of the map, this person just became the new kill leader. So basically say, go kill that person. Yeah, or beware of that person, right? right? And the game also, like, we we play recon, very important to know where people are. You can ping places on the map. This game is a game of, the reason I like it so much is there's so much information involved and so much processing and, and teamwork and figuring out how to do stuff together. And honestly, I've been playing with one of my friends, Ryan, who's absurdly good at these kinds of games. He is my out. <laughs> he is the way I win games. I'll pick up better armor than him, and I'll just be like, hey, I'll Ryan, protect you. take this. No, 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 no just, just take it. <laughs> Trade me whatever you have, because you're going to be worth so much more in a fight than I am that there's no reason that I should be taking the stuff that's only, like, let's say I can I can do 100 damage a minute. If he does 1,000 damage a minute, you're right. gonna wanna give him as much chance to get to that minute as possible. <laughs> give him the better guns, give him everything, work with him, listen to what they're saying. You know, like all these things really do come into play in the game like this. And that's why I've been liking it so much. So maybe Very I'll cool. see you guys out there. All right. I probably won't be playing. I'm not good at first person shooters. I used to play a lot more when I was a kid. That was the thing. So that's why I'm like, oh, finally a first person shooter that isn't Fortnite. They need real time strategy games to come back. I'm good at those. Yeah, Civ three. Starcraft, something like that. Civ is not real time. It takes too long to like. That's a totally different thing. Starcraft, yeah, three. Hmm. Hmm. Blizzard, are you there? Probably. They're probably working on it, but the way they work, it's probably not coming out for a decade or so. Yeah, I don't even know if it would really be relevant this day and age. Yeah. RTSs. Why? They're cool. People should make more. It doesn't have to be Blizzard. Okay. <laughs> something else is cool. Our good friends, the Masters of Modern Podcast, they talk about the modern format, as you would expect, all things competitive magic. It's hosted by Alex Kessler and Ben Bateman, and you can find them on Twitter at the MMCast right next to us at collecting.company. They're also doing videos, uh, content, 
I think they're doing video content in addition to the podcast also. I think they have some oh, other video stuff that's going on. So you might want to just type Masters of Modern into the search bar on YouTube and just subscribe to their channel because I think they're just planning to do a lot more magic-related content. Also, uh, if you guys are around for uh, Magic Fest LA, oh, yeah. uh, they are holding uh, some meetups, some, some events. So just check it out. I, I've seen them advertising for it on Facebook. I was doing a quick calculation. This is actually the episode that comes out right before GPLA. What weekend is it? It's uh, the March. weekend after next weekend, which we record ahead of time. So it's March right. 1st through 3rd. This is the episode just prior to GPLA. So we're going to be there also. Uh, I will not be there. Oh, you're not going to be there? No, I'm going to be in Florida. Playlist Live, which is a YouTuber convention, happens at the exact same time. And, well, YouTube, my first love. My bad. I will be there. Josh will be there. I will be there. Uh, maybe I'll give you a picture or something to carry around. <laughs> but make sure, yeah, you check out the Masters of Modern. They're doing some events and some meetups and stuff. Huge and picture. Yeah. I'll be on like a little iPad robot. And like, hello, everyone. I don't know why I'm talking like a robot. But yeah, check out Masters of Modern and what they'll be doing for Magic Fest slash GPLA. And definitely right. come find me. I will be looking for Commander Dam games commander each. damage josh commander. is always looking oh, for yeah. commander damage no by bring the way. it bring it and people always try to kill me with it and it gives me a better chance to win each of those games <laughs> so so please bring your commander damage fire it away at me kill me first uh, every game i'm used to it amazing uh, we definitely we'll get some hangouts in and uh yeah i may or may not be at their event but we will definitely be you know and by we, I, yeah, by we i mean like the other people of the crew here a lot mm -hmm. of the other game nights are going to be there so come find us and uh, we'll get some We'll do some battle. Yeah, I'll, I'll find you guys at GP Vegas. That's for sure. Magic Fest Vegas. Our editor for the show is Josh Murphy. Murph. Special thanks to Jeffrey Palmer, who does the living card animations you find behind us on these screens, as well as the opening and outros of the show at YouTube.com YouTube slash the Command Zone Podcast. You can find Jeffrey at Living Cards MTG. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you next time. Peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs> <laughs>